Good evening. I'm happy to welcome you all to the second event of the webinar series of, from Malabar to Koromandri, co-organized by Deccan Heritage Foundation, the Center of Islamic Studies, University of Cambridge, and H. S. Srikanth Narsimhraj Wadia Foundation, myself. Today's lecture focuses on medieval architects, sculptors, and other creators left their name on the temples and landscapes they shaped, whom the speaker will present alongside an array of other creators from the Malaprabha River Valley, Northern Karnataka. Also explains that these writings in stone are eloquent records of how the architects and artists communicated with one another and with the wider public. It's my pleasure to welcome and introduce Ms. Vashini Kaligotla, an architectural historian. She's an assistant professor in the Department of Art History at Yale University. Her research focuses on sacred architecture, Buddhist, Hindu, and Jain, with emphasis on the ancient and medieval periods. Her forthcoming book, Shiva's Waterfront Temples, Architects and Their Audiences in Medieval India, examines the creative resources of Deccan architects in dialogue with the response of their contemporary audiences. The book is an account of shared cultural and aesthetic values that shaped built space in the medieval Deccan. A second book project, provisionally titled Seeing Ghosts, is interested in the iconographies of death and the afterlife in early Indian notion realms. Kaligotla is also a practicing poet and an author of the poetry collection Bird of the Indian Subcontinent. Once again, I welcome all of you and especially Ms. Kaligotla. Over to you, Vivek. <laughs> Can I just give uh, Subhashini a minute to share her screen now? Oh, you'd like me to do that now? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Is that uh, visible to everyone? Yes, it is. Um, you can start whenever you're ready. Okay. Um, thank you, Vivek. And my thanks to Her Highness, the Maharani of uh, Mysore for her generous introduction. And my thanks to the Royal Vadiar Foundation, as well as the Deccan Heritage Foundation, the Center for Islamic Studies at the University of Cambridge for bringing us all together and for organizing this wonderful series that brings scholarship on the Deccan to a wider public. And my thanks as well to all of you for being here. I know that uh, uh, there are people who are joining us from various parts of India uh, as well as the world. So thank you so much for, for joining us. Uh, what I'll do is I'll speak for about 40 minutes and then we'll uh, turn it over to you for your questions and responses to my talk. Expert opinion about the architects of the Deccan region's magnificent medieval temples is fairly consistent. The standard view is that pre-modern India's temple makers cannot be known. Their presence in the historical record is shadowy at best, since only names and some fragmentary genealogies, but no biographies survive. As a result, historians do not ascribe artfulness or aesthetic interest to pre-modern India's makers. And all innovation, all design involvement is attributed to patrons, rulers, and other elites. In fact, even the names we give to medieval Indian temples reflect that understanding. Medieval temples go by the names of ruling families, such as Chalukya, Rashtrakuta, Kakatiya, and Hoysala. In this talk, my central concern is the self-presentation of architects, builders, and other makers. I'll present a range of early Deccan texts in stone that name makers and sometimes praise them. I'll use the terms inscription and epigraph when I refer to these texts. I look at such writing in stone at three places in Northern Karnataka, Patadakal, Aihole, and Badami. I'll consider both the physical presence of these texts as well as their linguistic meanings and show how both together made an impact on audiences, communicated with audiences. In other words, I'm interested in how early Deccan makers presented themselves to their contemporary communities in material and textual ways. 
And I'll argue that the physical presence of these texts, even when they give us only names, tell us a great deal about how makers saw themselves and presented themselves to their audiences and to other makers. I'll also use the word maker when I refer to pre-modern India's architects, builders, sculptors, and other creators. And we can certainly talk about my choice of that term in the Q&A. Let's begin with an inscription from the Virupaksha temple complex in Patarakkal. And that's the temple that I just showed you, that image that, that was just showing. The text in English translation reads, and that text is here for you. Hail, Sri Sarvasiddhi Acharya, the possessor of all virtues, the maker of many cities and buildings, whose conversation is entirely perfect and refined, who has for a jeweled crown and crest jewel the buildings and palaces and vehicles and seats and couches that he has constructed, the eminent architect of the Deccan. This text is part of a larger inscription that is written in stone on the temple's eastern gateway. In fact, we find two inscriptions on that gateway. Together, these texts give us information about the temple's architect, whose name is Sri Gundan, the temple's patron, Queen Loka Mahadevi, and the reigning Deccan king at the time, Vikramaditya II. The Virupaksha is Patadakal's grandest temple, and this epigraph would have been one of the first texts to engage medieval visitors approaching Patadakal from the shores of the Malaprabha River. The verse praises the temple complex's chief architect in literary language that draws on the courtly values of medieval India. It's one of the finest epigraphs to address the medieval architect, and it certainly contradicts the axiomatic notion of the pre-modern maker's unknowability. Patarakkal is a temple cluster in the southwestern part of the Deccan in today's Indian state of Karnataka. Its principal shrines were built in the local red sandstone and constructed during the late seventh century and into the eighth century. Three shrines, including the Virupaksha, were sponsored by the imperial Chalukyas who controlled the Deccan from the sixth to the eighth centuries AD. Patarakkal is believed to be the coronation capital of these same Chalukya rulers. The buildings, as you can see, stand on the left bank of the Malaprabha River facing east and address the river as it flows gracefully northward. The Deccan region, as we know, as many of us know, is the high arid basalt plateau in peninsular India, extending from the Arabian Sea to the Bay of Bengal, or in the words of, uh, of our series from Malabar all the way to Coromandel. It encompasses four states of the Indian Republic, Maharashtra, Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, and Telangana and is home to at least three major language communities, speakers of Marathi, Kannada, and Telugu. The Deccan was a major contact zone, a crossroads that had long interacted with cultural spheres in Central Asia, China, Southeast Asia, the Indo-Gangetic Plain, and Southern India. And its architectural worlds reflect that cosmopolitanism, that know-how. The Virupaksha is Patadakal's most complex shrine, and that cannot be exaggerated. It's dedicated to the worship of God Shiva in his linga form. The temple is in fact the only shrine at the cluster of temples at Patadakal in active worship today. The complex comprises the main Shiva temple, a separate pavilion for Shiva's bull vehicle, Nandi, and 30 smaller shrines that encircled the main temple and were built into an enclosing wall. So what I'm showing you here is on the left, we have a ground plan of the temple, uh, of the complex actually, and on the right, we have two images. One is of the main Shiva temple, which corresponds with the structure here on the, the ground plan. And the other is of course, a pavilion for Shiva's loyal devotee, Nandi, uh, which is the structure here on the ground plan. 
we can in, enter the enclosure of the temple via two gateways, which are on the east and on the west. The inscription that I read is carved on the eastern gateway. Today, I consider the physical or material properties of this text, as well as its linguistic choices, in order to reflect more broadly on the social positions of makers in early medieval India, which is roughly the period from the 6th through the 13th centuries. I'm interested in exploring the idea that inscriptions communicate in a variety of nonverbal ways. I want to show that the bodily encounter with such texts was just as important as what the texts say. Text naming makers were carved on or near temple doorways and along the ritual approach to the temple's most holy space, which is the sanctum. The texts were paired with imagery that was associated with beauty, auspiciousness, protection, and pleasure. So my argument is that the physical character of these texts and their sensory impact enhance their meaning for contemporary visitors to these temples. And if we pay closer attention to these characteristics, we can get closer to the historical individuals they name. Of course, I'm the first to admit that we have limited access to many aspects of medieval makers. We know little about their life stories, training, decision-making processes, subjectivities, and working methods. Moreover, no texts on art, that is, shastras, have come down to us for the Deccan. Though we do have art and architectural treatises, that is Shastras, for Tamil country, Western India, Central India, and other parts of the subcontinent. Yet, the broader early medieval Deccan corpus that I examine in my book, which comprises some 200 buildings, is known for its sophistication and juxtaposition of a variety of architectural styles, sculptural motifs, religious traditions, languages, and scripts. And temple makers, image makers, and other creators have left eloquent traces through the shape they gave to space and through epigraphic texts. And if better exploited, these material traces promise to tell us much about what it meant to make in early medieval India from the perspective of makers as well as their audiences. Let's return to the Virupaksha Temple's gateway epigraphs and consider a medieval visitor's bodily encounter with these texts. Today's visitors to Patadakal must access the temple compound from the paved road to the north of the cluster. However, the, eastern, the easterly orientation of most buildings suggests that period visitors, that is medieval visitors, access the temple from the east, that is from the river front, from the, from the shores of the Malaprabha River. Possibly some came by boat. There they would have come face to face with the Virupaksha Shrine's Eastern Gateway and, the, and its two epigraphs naming architect, chief queen and reigning monarch. So this is a, this is a view of the temple cluster from the river. While the riverfront is now forlorn of people and activity, we have to imagine it teeming with shops and other commercial enterprises set up to cater to visitors, worshipers, and pilgrims. The range of goods on offer would have been various, appealing to the senses of sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch. As is typical of sacred waterfronts across South Asia, we cannot rule out the possibility that ghats once lined the Malaprabha River. These stepped platforms leading to the water would have accommodated bathing, musical performances, dining, play, and of course, prayer and contemplation. Only after traversing such a worldly atmosphere redolent with sensory stimuli did the visitor arrive at the Virupaksha's Eastern Gateway. But I do wanna say that these images that I'm showing you here, these, these colorful active um, images are from Banaras in Uttar Pradesh in North India. Um, and uh, this, is, this is our present approach to the, to the Virupaksha temple complex from the river. But just these images are just to give you a sense of what medieval visitors might have 
experienced as they approached the Virupaksha Temple's Eastern Gateway. Okay, now let's talk a bit about this, this gateway. The sandstone building is rectangular in plan with an open pillared porch and a central east-west passageway. At the head of the passageway on the engaged columns of the porch are our two inscriptions. Both are written in the Telugu Kannada characters of the eighth century and appear on the front face of the columns on the aspect facing the viewer, facing the visitor um, as, as they're getting ready to go into the temple. It's worth pausing over the fact that no other writing appears on the building except these epigraphs. The North inscription tells us that the temple's architect, Sri Gundan, has been honored by the title through Bhuvanacharya, meaning the maker of the three worlds, and three times with another ceremony whose meaning is not entirely clear to historians. The pendant inscription on the south is the one with which I began the talk. It's a praise poem to the very same architect composed in a high Sanskrit register. M.K. Dhalikar has noted that it is the finest South Asian inscription to address a sutradhari or chief architect and it's certainly one of the few medieval Indian texts to discuss an architect at some length, at, at such length, I'm sorry. But what was the sensory impact of the writing on a visitor in a space like the porch, which is dominated by figural, vegetal, and architectural imagery? It's most likely that the text, which combines regional Kannada with literary Sanskrit would have been legible only to elite males and the Brahmin priesthood. But it would be a mistake to disregard the text's meaning for a wide spectrum of audiences. And it's this aspect that I'll first examine before turning to the epigraph's literary devices. The location of the patriarchal epigraphs and the sandstone medium on which they were carved mark the text as public and permanent documents their position along the Eastern approach to the sanctum, which is the ritually prescribed approach to the temple's most holy space also works in concert with the written word. And this will become clear by taking a closer look at the plan of the temple and temple complex. Again, these are the, the two inscriptions, the North and the South inscription, and this is just giving you a sense of the, the South inscription. The east facing temple is organized into a sanctum preceded by a pillared hall or a mandapa, which is a word that is familiar to many in our audience today. Three porches on the east, south and north provide access to this hall, to this mandapa. The holiest part of the building, the sanctum housing God Shiva's transcendent linga form is on the west. The gateway is aligned with the sanctum and at the head of the ritual path that a worshiper needs to follow from the worldlier part of the temple toward its most secluded interior and holy space. The epigraphs would flank the worshiper as they, as they move towards um, the, the sanctum. So they would flank worshipers at the threshold of this path and they would have prepared them for the ritual journey they were about to begin. Because the texts appear at the doorway, they would have created a frame of mind and conditioned the individual before he or she entered the building. The important point is that they did so in ways that transcend pure textual meaning. Again, let's, uh, let me just quickly go back to the plan um, so this, uh, this structure here that I'm pointing to is the main temple. Um, this, this structure here at the back is the sanctum which houses the linga. And um, these epigraphs, these texts are on the Eastern gateway in line with the sanctum. And, and they, would have been what, they would have been the first text that the worshiper encountered as they prepare to move into the temple. Other aspects of the physical character of these epigraphs, such as their pairing with sculpted imagery, also conditioned worshippers. 
In particular, I want to emphasize how temple alamkaras or ornaments, which connoted aesthetic pleasure and auspiciousness, enhanced the epigraph's import. Notice that the gateway inscriptions are carved onto a roundel and a square block and closely paired with images of mithuna or amorous or loving couples. The figure of the couple appears below the north and south inscriptions. The sculptor has evoked the pair's intimacy by entwining their arms and curving the woman's body into the man's. The man in turn leans his head towards his mate. Their bodily ornaments indicate that the figures move in courtly settings. Heavily bejeweled bodies support tall tapered crowns on the men and coiled hairstyles on the women. A slender tree with fantastical cur curlicues for branches and leaves brackets the couple on the south and at the bottom, a monkey slyly teases the woman and pulls on her garment. That The monkey is, an, is a lovely touch. What I'm saying is that the figure of the couple augmented, magnified, and enhanced the experience of the text for its medieval viewers. The text worked with such images to communicate in nonverbal ways. More specifically, the image of the couple worked according to the South Asian understanding of ornament. Ornament is in fact an inadequate translation of the Sanskrit term alamkara, which again, many of us know. Alamkara derives from the root verb, the root Sanskrit verb kra, meaning to make or to do, and the adverb alam, which means sufficient. So ornament understood in the sense, so ornament in the sense understood by ancient and medieval Indian courtly culture is not superfluous or superficial decoration, but rather a means to make an object efficacious, to aid in the working of an object. Other related Sanskrit words give us the following additional meanings for alamkara, for ornament, to strengthen, to magnify, to increase, to support, to nourish. And this is a really important difference. Uh, and this is something that we should be thinking about when we're looking at Indian and South Asian art. More broadly speaking, alamkara was a worldview that regulated the lives of the people of the court. It animated Sanskrit drama and poetry, constituted speech, and determined how people adorned their bodies, of course, but it also determined how people interacted with and understood one another. So it is a big deal. Alamkara is a big deal. But what about buildings, which is our concern here? What did medieval India have to say about the ornamentation of buildings? A range of images was considered essential for the alamkara of buildings, whether temples, monasteries, or palaces and pavilions. The loving couple, which we've looked at, was one such alamkara, along with door guardians and female figures, and there are many other alamkaras. These ornaments were thought to bring the building good fortune and also believed to protect the structure from evil forces, bad luck, and natural calamities. One further aspect about the Eastern Gateways couples that would have had meaning for their medieval audience is the couple's garden setting. For the medieval Indian court, the garden was a site of erotic pleasure and aesthetic enjoyment. Gardens were removed from the palace and its strict controls on conduct and could therefore allow for the pursuit of pleasure. Perhaps no image better illustrates the couples and the gardens associations with pleasure than an image from the main temple's north porch. It's far better preserved than the Eastern Gateway's sculpture, as you can see. Here we have a captivating pair, which entwines under a mango tree, whose pendulous fruits sway between the two figures. The image maker has drawn out the lusciousness of the fruit and the sensuality of the human body both male and female. Here too, an inscription in finely incised eighth century characters sits snugly above, above the pair on a square stone block like the one on the Eastern Gateway. Though 
this inscription does not name an architect, it shows the importance of such configurations and such placements for enhancing the meaning of these stone writings. And you know, this is this image is not unique to the temple. We have such configurations all over the this temple and at other temples. So my point is that uh, we have to look at where these texts appear and with what other kinds of imagery they appear. Let me now turn to the contents of the text and show how Alamkara ornament was crucial there too. First, I want to highlight the language choices that the, that the gateway epigraphs make. By this time period, that is by the seventh and eighth centuries, both regional and cosmopolitan scripts and languages were available to Deccan writers. And what's exciting and I can't stress that word enough about the Virupaksha Temple's gateway epigraphs is that they're bilingual, meaning they use two languages or at least two linguistic registers. The text in praise of the architect is in Sanskrit, the prestigious Pan-Asian language, whereas the rest of the inscription, which informs us about the patron, the ruling king, and his military expeditions is in Kannada, the regional language of the Southwestern Deccan. Some scholars have explained this linguistic phenomenon as a division of labor. So the idea is that in the period between 300 and 1300 AD, Sanskrit was used in South and Southeast Asian inscriptions for expressive and imaginative reasons, while the practical and mundane work of epigraphs was left to regional languages. So this is a phenomenon that we're seeing all over South Asia and Southeast Asia. And I don't intend to quarrel with this argument here. It's certainly noteworthy that we're seeing the use of Sanskrit to sing the architect's praises. And I also wish to highlight the Sanskrit terms that the epigraphs use to describe the Virupaksha temple's architect. And some of these words are Sutradhari, Sarvasiddhi Acharya, Tribhuvan Acharya, and Pitamaha. Let's take the term Sutradhari which I understand as architect or chief architect. This word appears in the inscriptions of the Deccan from as early as the fifth century AD. And we see it at Ajanta, for instance, and we see it well into the Vijayanagara period. So that is into the 14th, 15th centuries. And in medieval India, Sutradharis had expertise in many domains, such as engraving, sculpting, building, supervision, and writing texts on art and architecture. It's clear that at Patidakal, the term refers to a high-ranking professional who was responsible for overseeing the project of designing and building the Queen's Temple at this coronation capital of the Chalukyas. Now, we have other words such as Acharya, which indicate that Gundan was a man of proficiency and likely acted as a teacher or guru for junior artists. We have still other terms like Pitamaha and Tribhuvanacharya which equate Gundan with creator gods such as Brahma and the, the heavenly architect Vishwakarma. The literary devices that the Virupaksha texts use to praise our, architects, our architect are equally revealing. The texts present him as a man of the court or a Nagaraka. He's said to be Sakala Gunashraya, that is possessing all virtues. One crucial virtue that he's said to possess is the ability to speak beautifully. In fact, refined speech and the ability to adorn that speech were considered necessary moral virtues that separated courtly men from other classes of people like women, children, and monks. Another key literary device that the texts use is to describe the architect's creations as his ornaments. In other words, the epigraphs compare the architect's creations to his crown jewels and to his um, crowns. One final remarkable element about the text is the range of the architect's creations. I mean, this is, this is something. Our medieval architect was no less than any modern star architect. 
his repertoire extended from cities and urban spaces to buildings like palaces and temples and mansions to interior design features like chairs and couches. So I think this is something really valuable that this epigraph is, is telling us. Let me summarize then what the Virupaksha texts are doing to present this Deccan architect. And I want us to think about the what and the how. The what is the contents of the text. So what are the texts saying? This includes such things as the name of the architect, his moral and intellectual qualities, his skills, and the range of his expertise. And, uh, and I've just talked about these things. All these elements present our architect as a virtuous man and a learned courtly and skilled man. But what about the how? There are many dimensions to this question. One is that of course the architect is represented, <clears throat> excuse me, in a prestigious idiom in Sanskrit, <clears throat> sorry, um, in Sanskrit as opposed to Kannada. But equally significant is the physical character of these texts and the resulting bodily encounter with these texts. An eighth century visitor poised at the Eastern gateway of the Virupaksha temple complex was conditioned by a number of nonverbal cues and by the placement and position of these texts. The texts appear on the Eastern riverfront facade of the temple along its most ritually important east-west axis and in alignment with the sanctum. In addition, the texts are paired with loving couples in a garden setting, and these images augment the experience of these texts for our medieval visitors because of their associations with beauty, well being, and protection. I want to now take us to a few other temples and, and places in the Malaprabha Valley with maker texts. These texts are not as long as the Virupaksha temple texts, and some only give us names, but I contend that we should take their physical character more seriously because, as I, sh as I shall show, their physicality was clearly important to their medieval audiences. And if we do so, if we do take these texts seriously, they promise to enliven the historical individuals they name. I'm going to start with the Papanatha temple, also in Patadakal. It's just a few hundred yards south of the Virupaksha temple on the same riverfront. Here an inscription tells us that Reva di Ovaja made this eighth century temple. We also know that Ovaja and the architect of the Virupaksha temple belong to the same community of builders. That's really important information that we have and it's really exciting information that, that we have. This epigraph is not as long or as literary as the Virupaksha text, nor as prominently placed, but it too is carved on the building's principal Eastern facade. It too is paired with a loving couple, in this case, a flying celestial couple. In addition, the topography of the epigraph suggests that it would have been seen as visitors circle the building during worship. Other texts on the building's exterior suggest that oral engagement was important to the experience of such texts. In fact, the south and north elevations of the building are sculpted with scenes from the Ramayana and Mahabharata epics. Most of these scenes carry labels identifying the main character. Take this scene, which is one of my favorites from the Papanatha south wall. We see that the two monkey kings, Valin and Sugriva, are in hand-to-hand -hand combat, while Rama, the hero of the epic, is poised to strike an arrow at Valin from a hiding place. The epigraphs point out Rama, Sugriva, and Valin, which is again a really wonderful thing that we have. And we have this very early and much earlier than, 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 the, temple, than the temples at, uh, at Padarakal. So what this means is that the visitor could witness the unfolding of the entire epic from the birth of Rama 
to his defeat of Ravana and his coronation on the Papanatha South Wall. It's quite probable that visitors moved from one sculpted scene to another, pointing out cherished episodes and using the epigraphs as guides to storytelling. It's probable too that the name and praises of the building's maker were remarked upon in such encounters. Oral culture and oral encounter must have been important to the reception of the maker epigraphs at both the Virupaksha and Papanatha temples and indeed of many such medieval texts. The next temple with a maker epigraph that I want to show you is at Aihole. We have to travel 14 kilometers to the north of Pajadakal. We're still in the Malaprabha River Valley. Aihole is on, on that river. If, if Pajadakal was the coronation capital of the Chalukya rulers, then Aihole was a headquarters for influential trading corporations and attracted temple building during the second half of the first millennium and well into the second millennium. Some 100 temples are clustered in an area about 0.75 square miles in radius. And our maker epigraph is at the 8th century Huchapaya temple, and it celebrates its maker with the following verse. And again, we're, we're so lucky to have these kinds of verses celebrating these medieval architects. Hail, there has not been, and there shall not be, in Jambudvipa, any wise man proficient in the art of building houses and temples equal to Narasoba. Once again, architect Narasoba's virtues are being sung in Sanskrit as at Patadakal's Virupaksha temple. This is a poem that exalts in the repetition of V, N, and Bha sounds in the Sanskrit original. Narasoba is acclaimed as a learned man, an educated man, the likes of whom there has never been, nor shall there ever be in all of Jambudvipa. That's a big claim. As, as many of you know, Jambudvipa is the island of the rose apple tree. Jambudvipa is the entire cosmos in Brahmanical, Buddhist, and Jain understandings of the world. And India is but a small part of Jambudvipa. What this means is that this text imagines that Narasoba's architectural proficiency extends into immense poetic and mythic territory. By contrast, the Patadakal texts that we just saw represent the makers of the Virupaksha and Papanatha temples as experts in a much smaller and more constrained geographical space, namely Deccan country. Those two Patadakal architects are claimed as Deccan architects. Importantly, the Aihole epigraph also appears at the threshold of the temple on axis with the sanctum, and its meaning is enhanced by auspicious imagery such as door guardians, wealth deities, and loving couples. So you can see the door guardian pretty clearly. This is a wealth deity, a nidhi uh, here, and then we have, um, we have uh, loving couples here on the right. My last stop is Badami, the first capital of the Chalukya dynasty and the location of four celebrated cave temples. Badami was the Chalukya capital from 542 to 642 AD, so for about 100 years. The urban space lies within a so-called box canyon. What this means is that Badami is enclosed by cliffs on three sides the north, south, and east, and there's an opening to the canyon on the west. So this gives us basically a U shape, and that's all a box canyon is. The cave temples were built into the southern hill. I want to explain one more thing here. The temples that we've been looking at so far at uh, Padarakal and Aihole are what are called constructed temples. So these are built by an additive process of building a, a piling stone upon stone and fitting stone into stone. Whereas the temples that we're going to look at at Badami are rock cut temples. So they're scooped out of the, of the cliff sides by removing stone. So it's a subtractive process. And we call these temples rock cut temples or cave temples. And one more thing I want to say is that the pictures just don't do Badami justice. It's a stunning place that offers 
sweeping views with temples on lofty perches, perches and reached by narrow winding paths that are cut into cliff sides. If you haven't been to Badami, I strongly suggest you go. What I want to highlight is that the maker names appear in the vicinity of the four cave temples. And these cave temples are known as caves one through four. Because of the individuality of their presentation, the texts come closest to what we might think of as handwriting or signatures of these largely unknown makers. The writing and the temples all date to the second half of the sixth century. The names include at least three different surnames that denote professions such as stone cutter, sculptor, and architect. The crucial point I wanna make is that the fine spots of the text show that they were meant to be noticed. The names were inscribed on rock surfaces next to the shrines, to the left and right of entryways, near stairways and other points of access and above entrances. And negative evidence is important here as well because the absence of names is just as telling because we have an abandoned space at Badami partway between uh, caves two and three where we don't have names and we don't have mason marks, which, uh, which are marks that that tell us uh, how many days or hours uh, somebody worked at a particular site or at a particular commission. It's also worth contrasting the Badami evidence with the evidence from the Chandela capital, Kajuraho in central India. There we do have abundant maker names and we have them on two royal temples, for instance. But there it seems, and that's what research has suggested, that those makers didn't seem to be as concerned with self-presentation and they seem to be more concerned with account keeping. And what um, scholars Deheja and Rockwell have, have argued is that these names appear upside down, they appear sideways or at an angle. So at Kajuraho, um, they didn't seem to care about who saw these names. By contrast, at Badami, even names that are carved in out of the way places are visible to the naked eye and were clearly intended to be seen like this name on a cliff face between caves three and four that appears singly at a height of some 20 feet above ground. Other inscriptions that appear in groups reveal variations in size, depth of carving, writing style that indicate that visual style was being used to express differences within the community of makers. And what I'm showing you here is um, a group of names that appears next to the entrance of cave four, which is a Jain temple. And these names would have been visible to people entering the space, as you can see. The short texts have unique visual characteristics like signatures and distinct hands with the same letters formed idiosyncratically or individually. And particular care was taken with the honorific Shri. I, I know that many of you in the audience know what the word Shri is, but for the non-Indian audiences, Shri is, is like the word Sir. It's, uh, it, it, it accords respect. And many of these uh, names uh, have, the word, have the term Shri attached to them. And more importantly, care was taken with the, um, with the ways in which the word Shri was, was crafted, was written. This makes me think that we should pay attention to bodily perception when we think about how this architecture and its makers were received in the medieval Deccan. Badami is a dynamic and dramatic site. Some temples like the impressive Vaishnava Cave 3 only reveal themselves after visitors have exerted themselves on an uphill winding journey in which the temple appears and disappears from view only to reveal itself in a spectacular fashion. Visitors must climb up to the temple from the bottom of the hill after passing two other temples on their ascent. Cave one, which is a modest Shiva temple, is lowest at about 50 feet above street level. Next comes cave two, a temple to Vishnu higher up in the rock and northeast of the Shiva temple. So if you look at this, this um, South Hill at Badami, for instance, uh, you can see the cave temples. And this structure that I'm pointing to here at the bottom right is cave one. 
And so you have to ascend that hill and, and you can barely see it, but um, this is where cave two is. This is a Shiva temple. Cave two is a Vishnu temple. And then you have to keep climbing still further to get to cave three, which is back here. After passing cave two and ascending the hill further, we get to a stone gateway. From this point on the hill, we have panoramic views of the, of the box canyon in which Badami is situated. But cave three is nowhere in sight as it's obscured by the high cliff walls. Entering the gateway means being confined in a dark space that encloses the visitor and cuts off vision and most other sensory stimuli. Looking up, one sees just sky. Only as one nears the top of the stairwell and begins climbing out of the well, does one view the massive square courtyard in, one, in front of cave three and the lofty cliff face out of which makers have scooped out this royal temple to Vishnu. And it is a spectacular experience to come out of that, of that enclosed dark space onto this massive courtyard and see that lofty cliff face in front of you. Um, and so this is the, this is the opening uh, on the floor that, that you emerge out of in the, the photograph on the right. A tall rock face across from the temple's main entrance at the opposite end of the courtyard bristles with makers' names, as do the rock surfaces around the temple's main porch and the pathway leading to cave four. Which is why I find it difficult to believe that such placements were a matter of coincidence or that they were unauthorized or unintentional. Surely the names of makers were an integral part of the experience of contemporaries to these fabulous constructions that their patrons and makers took pride in creating. The foundation inscription of Cave 3 makes it clear that attention to craft was essential to the reception of this temple. The foundation inscription is just a text that tells us when the temple was built and who built it. This text dates the temple to 578 AD and tells us that this temple to Vishnu was built during Chalukya ruler Mangalesha's reign. Importantly, the text says that the temple was created by a maker of wondrous abilities. Sadly, we don't know the name of this maker, but looking at this image, we can see that um, uh, this, uh, you know, the makers of this temple were surely wondrous makers. The Sanskrit word used to describe his abilities is adbhuta, and it has a range of other meanings, marvelous, curious, splendid, and astonishing. The text goes on to tell us that the temple surpassed anything made by the gods and was most worthy of viewing. Of course, the temple's physical features confirm that this was not just a rhetorical boast. Cave three is by far the most impressive shrine on the hill, if not in first millennium India, in terms of its scale, the grandeur of its sculpture, and in terms of its architectural design. So I want to make a few points in conclusion as I wrap up this talk. The Patadakal Virupaksha temple epigraph with which I opened the talk may be a rarity for medieval India, both for its length and the kind of attention it lavishes on a maker. But that epigraph and the many short epigraphs I analyzed alongside stress two things, the value of what maker epigraphs say and how they say it. It's clear that makers marshal language to declare their social status. Some like the Virupaksha temple architect identified themselves using Sanskrit professional terms like Sutradhari and Acharya, while others like the architect of Patadakal's Papanatha temple called himself Madidor, which is simply maker in Kannada. So what we see is that one is using Sanskrit, the other is using Kannada. We also see differences in the use of script as well, which I didn't talk about. 
the audiences they were addressing were also varied. Both the Virupaksha and Papanatha architects declared themselves as Deccan makers to Deccan peoples. Whereas in Aihole, the poet Ravi Kirti, for example, whom I was not able to discuss today, addressed a pan-Indian or subcontinental audience. Then we have Narasoba, who was addressing himself, it seems, to all of Jambudwipa, an even larger, vaster realm. So we're seeing language difference, and we're also seeing difference in the addresses to different groups of people. But all these makers distinguish themselves through visual style, and that's a point I kept returning to. Through the physical character and physical style of these texts and their topography in the landscape of the temple, and also within the very landscapes, uh, the broader landscapes that they were shaping. Even the short texts of Badami that I just showed employed visual style to distinguish themselves from one another, as we still do through fashion, through clothing, hair, makeup, and other accessories. All of which is to say that if we are, if we are alert to the physical and textual character of medieval Indian maker epigraphs, we'll be rewarded with the voices or the presences of these makers and the ways in which they communicated with one another and their various publics. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Subhashini. That was absolutely fantastic.